before we get on that ice. So this one's no good. If you try to pass by through this, you'll lose your snowmobile. SICA puts indigenous knowledge and observations front and center alongside weather and safety services, including sea ice products, tides, marine forecast, and satellite imagery. This lets hunters share dangerous and changing conditions with their communities using their own language and knowledge systems. We used to get our information on five different websites. Now with SICA, all that information is one place, also with the information from the elders and hunters. SICA includes profiles for wildlife, sea ice, and traditional place names in multiple dialects that are taggable and act as living wikis of indigenous knowledge. Using the mobile app while you're on the land, posts such as hunting stories and GPS tracks can be recorded and uploaded to SICU when you are back in your community. Integrating indigenous ways of knowing with a suite of modern technologies. SICU, the Indigenous Knowledge Social Network. Now available for Android, iPhone, and online at siku.org. Brought to you by the Arctic Eider Society. We knew the truth. We lived it. Nobody can never deny us that. We're trying our best to educate our young people to carry on. They know what happened. They'll carry on the truth. We know the truth. Stories to Inspire Reconciliation, a CBC special documentary. Thursday on CBC and CBC Gem. No History is proud to support Truth and Reconciliation Week. Hosted by the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. We work with First Nations, Inuit, and Métis to help research their history, to document their stories, and to share their past. We are committed to decolonizing history. We are No History. Come, get to know us. Siku, the Inuktitut word for sea ice, connects communities across the Arctic. Siku the Indigenous Knowledge Social Network. SICO is a mobile app and web platform created by and for Inuit, providing tools for weather, ice safety, and hunting stories, as well as knowledge transfer and language preservation. The weather's changing, the ice conditions are changing. And when we're driving a snowmobile or walking, we have to think before we get on that ice. So this one's no good if you try to pass by through this, you'll lose your snowmobile. SICA puts indigenous knowledge and observations front and center alongside weather and safety services, including sea ice products, tides, marine forecast, and satellite imagery. This lets hunters share dangerous and changing conditions with their communities using their own language and knowledge systems. We used to get our information on five different websites. Now with SICA, all that information is one place also with the information from the elders and hunters. SICA includes profiles for wildlife, sea ice, and traditional place names in multiple dialects that are taggable and act as living wikis of indigenous knowledge. Using the mobile app while you're on the land, posts such as hunting stories and GPS tracks can be recorded and uploaded to SICU when you are back in your community. Integrating indigenous ways of knowing with a suite of modern technologies, SICU, the Indigenous Knowledge Social Network, now available for Android, iPhone, and online at siku.org. Brought to you by the Arctic Eider Society. We knew the truth. We lived it. Nobody can never deny us that. We're trying our best to educate our young people to carry on. They know what happened. They'll carry on the truth. We know the truth. Stories to Inspire Reconciliation, a CBC special documentary, Thursday on CBC and CBC Gem.
I'm Say, good morning, my name. For those of you that don't know me, I was given the name Pimo Say Mayangan, which means walking wolf in the Ojibwe language over 33 years ago. My English name is Ray Stevenson. Everybody kind of knows me as Coco. And the song that I chose to open up with today is a song that acknowledges our women. You know, our women play a huge part in the relationship that we have amongst our people and the culture that we have. So this song talks about our warrior women saying thank you and acknowledging them. with the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. Today, our focus is on truth and reconciliation. This morning, we have a French session with Wabakoni Tele-Quebec on truth and reconciliation, Micmac ancient history through storytelling with Julie Pellissier-Lush, talking about residential schools with kids, with Rebecca Thomas, and Truth and Reconciliation Allyship with Teresa Edwards. This afternoon, join our session with the National Arts Centre, Indigenous Performing Arts with Kevin Loring, Lori Marchand, and Marie Brascoupé. We will have Speaking Our Truth with Sheila Rogers and Monique Grace Smith, Keeping Reconciliation Alive with TRC Commissioner Dr. Marie Wilson and Inuit Games and Arctic Sports with Kyle Kayak World. If you feel you have the need to talk to someone about what you learned or witnessed, I remind you that we have healing supports. Healing supports are available each day online. Thank you. Since time immemorial, we've flourished on Turtle Island. This is our home, where we've raised generations upon generations of our children. Our languages, cultures, and ceremonies define who we are and our connection to this land. Great numbers of foreigners started arriving on our shores. Desires for furs drove them deep into our territories. Millions died through diseases that came with them. They also brought their system of education. All the while, our foods were disappearing and our lands stolen. We began to starve. Soon, their network of residential schools stretched from coast to coast to coast. We were forced to attend. They finally closed these schools in the 1990s. By then, generations of us had attended. We are sorry. We are still here. These are our stories. We share them with you, who we are, what we've gone through, and the path that lay ahead. 
everyone. As Indigenous people here at the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation and the University of Manitoba, we are so thrilled that we have a day of National Truth and Reconciliation. It's a day where we can all come together and just really think about the history of Indigenous people in Canada and to really reflect on what that means. Many Canadians do not know about the history of Indian residential schools and what happened to Indigenous kids at those schools. And that's unfortunate because it was never taught in school. But you have an opportunity to learn about what that means. Many Indigenous kids were taken away from their moms and dads, from their parents and from their homes, and they were taken away to a school and weren't always able to come home for maybe as much as a year and sometimes didn't come home at all. What's really unfortunate is that many Indigenous kids don't know this history either. They may know that their moms and dads or their grandparents had gone to a school and were sad about that experience and about having had to leave home, but they don't really know what it meant to be at the residential school. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission raised awareness of what had happened to those kids and this is an opportunity for you to learn more about what that means. So many people from around the world come to Canada because it's a safe place to be. There's good housing, there's good water, there's good education. That wasn't the case for all of the Indigenous people in Canada. So I would really encourage you to think about what it means to hear the truth and to really look at what reconciliation means. This is our day of National Truth and Reconciliation. Please spend some time learning about what that means and really enjoy yourself. Um, it's a good opportunity for learning about Indigenous people in Canada. Today is an important day of remembrance, a day to reflect on and to come to terms with the truth of the past and then to take action. Taking action for us at RBC includes working in partnership with the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation to honor survivors of residential schools and to remember those who never made it home. Thank you for watching and thank you to all those sharing their truth today. One, two, one, two. Is there any levels coming in? One, two, A, A.
So if I do that, Welcome back. Thank you. Oh, that's way better background. Great <laughs> job. <laughs> I might have found a roll of packing tape and a very <laughs> nice. interesting spider web of tape behind my snail. Nice. Do what you gotta do. <sighs> Make it work. I feel very fancy now, like I'm at a theater in front of the big red curtain. I'm, I'm so excited. Thank you so much for uh, speaking, and I'm, I'm just very, very thrilled. Well, I'm excited to be doing it. It's a great opportunity to partner with NCTR, so the more people we reach, the better. Yeah, yeah so there, there's one video that I have, which is credits. Um, I'll be playing that on my end. Maybe uh, she was referring to that. of Truth and Reconciliation Week. We're so happy to have you joining us. My name is Kate. Uh, I'm with the RBC coming at you live from the University of to get to introduce our speaker today. Teresa Edward is a member of the Listiguch Micmac First Nations in Quebec. 
Teresa is an international human rights lawyer and executive director of the Legacy of Hope Foundation. And we are so pleased to welcome you to this session, Legacy of Hope, Truth and Reconciliation Allyship. Thank you so much, Kate. So can I just jump in or? Okay, great. So I just wanted to first acknowledge that I am coming to you live from Ottawa, which is uh, Algonquin unceded territory. And as you mentioned, I am Mi'kmaq First Nation from Lissagouj. Quebec is in our territory. And um, my traditional name is Bukdaway Ebidez, which means young firewoman. So I'm really excited to be able to join you all today. And I thank you for taking the time and having the willingness to be open our history, our shared history, particularly about residential schools and the impacts it still has on Indigenous people today. Um, but I'm heartened by the fact that everyone is here willing to learn, understand, be respectful and looking for ways to become an ally. So I hope I can get to that. I have what looks like a really long PowerPoint, but as I've mentioned, I'm going to be flying through it and just focusing on a few key points. Um, and so that you should all know you have this PowerPoint available to you um, that you can access. And in within that PowerPoint, there's there are also uh, there's also a video clip about survivors and their testimony, which can be also accessed at a later time as well. And I've sent a whole flurry of other resources available that that can be accessed if for any reason you aren't able to find them you can go to the legacy of hope foundation and access them there so that's great so should we skip ahead to the powerpoint okay here we go thanks so much for that kate and for the team that are making this happen um so this cover photo it's from one of our exhibitions entitled Where Are the Children? And it was curated by Thomas Moore. And many of the um, images were taken from the partnership with Library and Archives or, and I should say from survivors themselves. So this is just to give you an example. Whoop, something happened, it disappeared. Are the AV there? See if I can't yeah, one second. It's all good. Yeah, it wouldn't be technology if we didn't have a <laughs> little bit of a hiccup. We just went through the practice and it was seamless, of course. Of course. All right. Okay, there we go. So just gonna do a little bit of highlights about the residential school system um, that you may or may not already know about. So they were developed as a series, I'd like to think of it as, um, you know, a string of beads or, you know, a bunch of beads on a string woven together uh, in, a circle of colonization uh, that were happening against indigenous people at the same time and over periods of time. So one of those beads of uh, colonization was the creation of residential schools and that was developed by the federal government, Department of Indian Affairs. And it's important to note that back way back when, when they started, um, it was originally called, referred to as the Indian Act, La Loi des Sauvages, the law of the savages. So right from the start when you had that you had also policies and and laws that were in place claiming doctrine of discovery or tele, terra nullius stating that the land was empty here in north america because indigenous people were not christian so legally they were being deemed as subhuman below human um not not counted essentially so as i mentioned those are all part of the steps in colonization um the government administered these, these uh, had, had churches administer these schools from uh, Anglican, Roman Catholic, Methodist, United Presbyterian, uh, even the um, Mennonites as well had roles to play in administering these schools. There was approximately 150,000 students that attended 
and this is important to note, um, we have documented 168 schools from the early 1800s and the last one closing in 97. Now, often you'll hear in the media that there's 139 schools and that they closed in 96. <coughs> Excuse me, <coughs> I'm getting over a cold, sorry. Um, the difference is that when you hear about it in the media, that is because they take the figures from the Government of Canada um, documentation, which lists the schools that were included in the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreements. But that does not mean that that, were, that was the total amount of schools in existence. There were other schools where records were lost, um, buildings were burnt down, there, were no documentation, there was no documentation. Um, so they, for whatever reason, they, those schools were not included in the settlement agreement. And in much of our material, our older material, which we've been systematically trying to change whenever we you know, renew a document or update it, one of our communication products um, is that they closed in 97. Because when we were visiting in Inuvik for an education meeting, we discovered that Grolier Hall, in fact, closed in 97 and not in 96. So it's important to note that. Also, we had originally estimated that there would be more than 15,000 students that had died while at residential schools. Um, and now we're thinking that that number is going to be significantly higher as we can see the numbers are climbing to more than half of that figure. And we've only started to uncover um, and unearth some of the um, remains of the children at some schools. So there's many, many other schools to still be um, checked. And a lot of these children died from acts of violence. And, um, you know, there's no other way to say murder, um, but others died of malnutrition, untreated illnesses, uh, not being vaccinated while other Canadian children were vaccinated. So a lot of children dying from things like TB where other Canadian children in their schools were receiving vaccinations for that. Um, malnutrition from the lack of uh, proper foods um, and the educational resources were basically farming, uh, religion, um, doing labor, not really math, English, you know, all the other programming that was received in other schools and as well as lack of medical treatment. So this is an, an important image here. It was used in what was called propaganda posters. So they were created um, for any Canadians that would question why this was being done. They created a situation, the government created a situation of fear among the Canadian population to state that we have to do this in order to control the native situation so that they will not pillage or kill our people. And, they floated images like that. this, which um, now today um, historians and our elders have affirmed these are you know, not factually correct. This is an image of a boy wearing girl hair ties, girl beads, holding a, a revolver and a knife. And that would not simply not be how a boy would be dressed in regalia or traditional um, clothing. So you'll see in a later photo that they you know, pitch the idea that this is what they look like as savages before, and that they would look prim and proper as um, once they had been through the residential school system. And we all know that, in fact, was not the case of what happened. Um, so from the early 1830s to 1997, there was more than seven generations of First Nations Inuit and Métis children, some as young as three, and we it, this says four, but again, um, remains have been found of children as young as three years old. And why that's important is because in policy, it was stated that children five to um, 16 would attend these schools. But we know from records that there were children as young as three, as old as 17 that attended. And um, the reason why they would take children of ages outside that perimeter was there was a financial incentive associated with that. So if children died while at a school, they needed to replace them with other children. And they weren't too um, discriminating about what age group they selected them from, so long as they increased their numbers. Um, so known as the residential school system, these children suffered abuses of the mind, the body, the spirit, emotional, sexual abuse, 
um, generations of Indigenous people have experienced deep and lasting impacts on generation after generation of survivors, their families and their communities and nations. Uh, I met a gentleman in Timmins who was telling me he, he was homeless and he was telling me that he was uh, fifth generation uh, that it had attended. So you can see how when you have generation after generation experiencing these harms and discrimination while in these schools, you would it would later lead to severe socioeconomic impacts and uh, problematic issues for Indigenous people in, in the country, right? Why is it important to Canadians? Why should it matter to anyone who never attended the school? Well, it matters because, I, as I was mentioning, there's post-traumatic effects. And as much as the healing and um, has happened, I, I would say we've had seven generations of these atrocities happening in residential schools, and we've had probably two generations of healing. Well, with that, you've also had seven generations of cultivated racism against Indigenous people. So I would like to think maybe we have two generations of undoing that. So there's going to be more work on both sides that needs to happen. And that's why I'm sharing this information with you today so that we can make that happen, right? Especially the younger uh, people, they are future decision makers, our lawmakers. And um, we know that by educating them about the true history, we build empathy, understanding, and um, that leads to inspired action to wanna to make sure that never happens again and that we end the injustices occurring against Indigenous peoples today. Um, so another thing that I always like to mention is uh, prior to having grandchildren, I had more free time and I used to volunteer at um, the Indigenous Women's Tawigan House of, um, for Homeless Indigenous Women and as well as Odawa with Indigenous Youth. And the reason I did that was because I wanted it to I wanted to convey to our youth that this is not the social, socioeconomic issues that we're having in society today are not who we are fundamentally as a, as a peoples. Um, we're over 54 First Nations and we have Inuit communities in the North and uh, eight Métis settlements. And for, you know, at least 18, 000, um, 14,850 years, our people were thriving with vibrant cultures and languages and complex governance and economic structures, rich languages, and were vital contributors to the foundation of Canada. So, and prior to Canada being Canada, prior to settlers coming here, we were thriving nations. So that is what I want our youth to understand. And I want Canadian youth to understand um, for us to have cultural pride as a people and for there to be mutual respect and appreciation for Indigenous peoples and what they have contributed to the country. It matters because Canada has been considered a world leader in human rights and advocated that we are, you know, a country where human rights matter. And it's been touted at uh, in the international community around the world. I've participated at the UN in both New York and Geneva for more than 15 years, where I would go and expose the situation of what happened in Canada. Um, but it hasn't always received the uptake that, um, that it, it could, um, as we're seeing that started to happen in May of this year with the unearthings of our children. Um, it matters because the residential school system and its impacts are linked to these major causes of racism, poverty, homelessness, um, self-harming behaviors, um, and the violence experienced by Indigenous people, particularly women. Um, it matters because Indigenous communities continue to face discrimination and injustice within policy, the law, procedures, and we suffer uh, high levels of trauma, loss of language and family connections, teachings, values, and continue ex to experience poverty, illness, and have less funding for education, um, still today comparable to Canadian children. And if, if you weren't aware, in a country as rich as Canada, we still have more than 100 communities that don't have access to running clean water. Um, it matters because we share this land, and although we're not personally responsible for what happened in the past, it's not hundreds of years old, the last school closing in 97, and then over from that, we know that there um, 
are now settlements happening for the day schools that took over by a lot of the same administrators that uh, ran the residential schools. And those continued right until the 2000s and onward. Um, we all have benefited as Canadians from what First Nations, Inuit and Métis have suffered and were forced to relinquish from the treaty commitments not being fulfilled. So I challenge everyone and say, we're all treaty people and we all have a role to play. So I'm really grateful that you're all here today. At LHF, we're committed to this candid exploration of Canada's real history. And I know we're flying through it today, but we have over 700 testimonies of survivors on our website. We have a document called Let the Truth Be Told, which has activities that teachers can access and uh, preview with their class at any time throughout the year. Um, we believe that education has this important role to play in healing uh, both Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people. And by creating awareness, empathy, and encouraging public engagement, we can start to foster understanding and reconciliation. And as Murray Sinclair says, education got us in this mess, education will get us out. So just to tell you very quickly, I know time goes very fast. LHF is a national Indigenous charitable organization. We don't receive core funding from the government yet. We're still uh, working on that. We're in year 21. We receive project funding. We do workshops. We sell curriculum. We have a lot of resources available for free. Uh, we loan. We have uh, over 25 exhibitions that we loan out to schools for free. Um, and we have competitive bids for the shipping costs, which is the only cost to borrow one of our exhibitions. And if you if you don't have the budget for that, we also have a, a shipping uh, grant that is available to teachers across the country. Um, if you ever want, to, a lot of them are booked, but you can still reach out to our info at legacyofhope.ca and they'll direct your email to our exhibitions and curatorial projects. Um, department and they can let you know what exhibitions we have or see if you can plan something for your school. Um, we fulfill our mandate by contributing towards reconciliation and we do a lot of work with survivors and it's really guided by the guidelines, ethical guidelines that survivors have to be um, cared for, not re-traumatized um, and anything we do, we always have elders, knowledge keepers, uh, uh, the um, residential school survivor uh, counselors available for them as well. And we bring forward their family members or support people at any of the events. And we include them in our content for our exhibitions, for our curriculum, uh, in recording the oral testimonies, because we know by having testimonies themselves from survivors, it creates a heart to heart connection. And it's probably one of the most powerful ways to really reach people and, and teach them about Indigenous history from a firsthand basis. Um, and we have a clear understanding of the need and importance for oral traditions. Although our traditions may vary from coast to coast to coast, out of our 54 nations and among First Nations, Inuit and Métis, one of the consistent things is that oral traditions is of great importance for Indigenous people. And so we use those testimonies as a way to honor the survivor, preserve their empowered statement that they have um, entrusted the legacy of hope with to be the stewards and protectors of these testimonies. And we also want to ensure that it contributes to the well-being, healing and empowerment of the survivors, their families and communities. The Orange Shirt Day, we, if you haven't heard about it, I'm sure there will be other sessions about the origins of this with um, Phyllis telling her story about wearing her favorite orange shirt to school and having it removed along with everything else that was slowly stripped away, whether it was language, family, culture, food, um, the home community, all of that was taken away. And so it started on September 30th every year that we began wearing our orange t-shirts to honor all residential school survivors. And it was used as a tool to teach kids going back to school so that they could learn about it in September right away and understand their experience and how different it is from what other uh, children experience when going back to school today. So that's just a little bit of a, a mention for that. And there are so many groups that have um, t-shirts available. For me, I don't see that as a negative thing. 
it, you know, if large companies have that to me, that's just more people that are going to raise awareness, more people who will ask what the meaning of orange shirts is, and the more people we're going to educate. As I mentioned, sharing experiences and testimonies from survivors is one of the most meaningful ways. So when you access this, you'll be able to access um, a, a video link to hear uh, survivor testimonies themselves. From 2005 to 2008, we did receive project funding from the government of Canada where we worked, uh, the LHF worked with 22 different um, Indigenous communities and organizations across Canada. And it was the first of its kind where we brought together survivors, their families and communities, and they were able to talk about their experience for the first time with other survivors and you know, um, really comfort one another, validate, mourn, heal, and we offered counseling services and made them aware of healing programs across the country in order um, to, at the same time that we were capturing their testimony. And I wanna make sure that you also realize that the testimonies that LHF has are completely different from the testimonies that were discussed in the news several years ago when they were talking about uh, possibly getting rid of the testimonies that were recorded. Those were in relation to the insurance and um, claim payments regarding the settlement agreement. These are very different from our testimonies. Our collection were really survivor empowered and um, you know, given to us in honor to protect and share these with Canada so that their stories would always be preserved in time and in history. And the first collection was called Our Stories, Our Strengths. And then in 2019, we sought funding for another project to build on that. And we went and interviewed the children and grandchildren of some of those survivors in a project called Our Stories, Our Strength, basically what I was just speaking about. And the exhibitions, as I mentioned, we have more than 25 different, um, well, not they're all not different, but we have say three of, of uh, five different ones. And then we probably have a collection of about 12 assorted exhibitions, some on the impacts of residential school on First Nations, some specific to Métis, some specific to Inuit. We also have on youth and reconciliation. We have on allies and honoring our ally, Dr. Peter Henderson Bryce, because he uh, specifically brought um, his report when the, the government, there was a lot of complaints by community leaders, uh, families about what was happening to the children in the schools. And the government hired Dr. Peter Henderson Bryce to investigate in 1927. And he did discover in fact that these atrocities were happening, reported back and unfortunately, residential schools remained open for another 70 years, even though they were aware of what was going on there. So the reason why we consider him an ally is because he chose to use his own money and produce his own report. And now we, um, the First Nation Caring Society, along with LHF, work with his family to continue to honor him. And we have an exhibition to that effect. Um, if you recall, these are the, prop, the, um, the posters I was referring to that they were saying, you know, this is what your the child will look like before, and this is what they'll look like afterwards. And this particular exhibition was all designed so that people could understand what children experienced in the life uh, at a residential school. Again, always trying to um, educate and inspire positive action. This is one of our flagship um, exhibitions. I'm just noticing the time's going quickly. Um, uh, called 100 Years of Loss. We've since revised that and we now call it Generations Lost, Killing the Indian and the Child, the Residential School System in Canada, um, as that more accurately depicts what happened. And originally the 100 years was sought, thought to be for marketing purposes, it would be catchy, you know, that people would remember, but we all know that it was more than 150 years. So we've changed that accordingly. And all of the exhibitions come with activity guides, whether it's for younger, um, you know, grade seven to 12, or even for adults. This particular one comes with a scavenger hunt and they're all bilingual as well. So it's all different ways 
for people to be able to absorb the information, whether it's through a PowerPoint, whether it's through audio and listening and you know watching uh, and hearing about the testimony of a survivor or experiencing the artwork and the exhibition. This is a permanent installation of a timeline that LHF has installed at Wabano Health Center here in Ottawa. It's just to give you an example. This is something we're really proud of. Um, LHF worked with the territories to uh, give them the basic curriculum and they adapted it to be more meaningful for each of their territories. It was originally launched in 2012 um, for uh, teacher training for social and Northern studies teachers, but I'm happy to say that more of the curriculum has been included throughout all of the education from kindergarten to grade 12 in many areas outside of just social and nor Northern studies. And it's our dream that that would be the case. And now these I just included in here for allyship. That's another document that I provided in the resources. It's called Raven as Messenger. And in our appendix, we literally have a how-to of things that you can do as a Canadian, as a student, as a class, um, as a school to foster reconciliation, you know, whether it be finding out on whose territory you are on, contacting and reaching out to the Indigenous community through the Friendship Centre or any local groups, having them come into the school, asking them about appropriate protocols and bringing them in, um, whether it's to learn information so that you can be armed with answers and responses to be able to rebut any stereotypes or racism that you might be hearing within family or friends. Um, and then there's other actions within your community or perhaps asking your member of parliament. And then we've grouped together some of the calls to action from the TRC, whether it's in child welfare, education, language and culture. Um, whoops. Uh, reconciliation, education, and then there's activities that you can do and extended activities that you can do. So those are all available to you. This is a more fluid, um, you know, message to allies about different things that you could do to be an ally. So you can live with gratitude and live lightly on the earth. You can respect and support Indigenous sovereignty. Learn about the treaties. What can your role be? Demand that our nation, our governments, honor treaty commitments. Consider future generations and all of your actions. Question and resist stereotypes, including team names, mascots, Halloween costumes, as that's coming up. You know, I think last year, probably because I wasn't out, but um, and because of lockdowns and things like that, I didn't see any um, anyone dressed in, you know, appropriating Indigenous culture. But that's my dream, too, is to have a Halloween pass without seeing anyone dressed that way. Um, reach out to your Indigenous neighbours, as I mentioned before. Slow down and listen more than you speak. Notice where you're, where you are. Learn about Indigenous peoples. And um, again, no one is an authority. And if there's something that I've shared, about my specific teachings, it is because those are the teachings that have come to me from my elders and in my life experience. You may learn very many different um, teachings that are from the West Coast or from other nations. So just be mindful that we are, we do all have differences and appreciate the diversity of nations and our peoples. And lastly, Bulaliak, it's in my language. Thank you. Miigwech, merci, merci cho, nakurmik, ikosi, nyawan goa. I can see it in many of the languages. Thank you. We hope that you continue to access these learning tools and commit to fostering reconciliation in Canada. Here is our website and our email. If you require anything, I'd be more than happy to um, provide that for you. Maybe I should leave that on this. There we go. Um, so right at 12.15. All the way from Brazil who have tuned in. I wanted you to know that they're listening uh, from, from all the way halfway across the world. That's amazing. And in the work that I've done at the UN, I would have to say that I, I remember being shocked that Indigenous people from across the globe have experienced the things that we've experienced in North America 
with um, loss of language, loss of land, loss of culture, imposition of residential school, imposition of a child welfare system. These were all um, you know, systematic and systemic issues that were created, even the reserve system, they were all created and um, indigenous people worldwide have been impacted from you know, Brazil, Ecuador, Mexico, including the issue of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Um, that's been uh, an issue worldwide. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. And I did not mention earlier, I am an intergenerational survivor. My mother did attend residential school. So I wanna honor her, uh, even though she's not with us, she's in the spirit world. I wanna acknowledge that and honor her for, um, you know, just to, to frame where I'm coming from in my experience. Everyone at the LHF are either survivors, intergenerational survivors of uh, residential school, day school, 60 scoop, or a combination. And we have allies that work with us as well. And I, I believe, and we're all on the healing journey and have been for quite some time, or we would not be able to do the kind of work that we're doing. And I didn't mention anything about self-care, but if there's anything that was triggering or traumatizing to any of you, I apologize and urge you to reach out to any uh, of, of the um, uh, numbers that you can access for counseling, whether it be for Indian residential school survivors and intergenerational survivors or any other mental health supports. And if that's not something you need to do, please do anything that fills your cup today and brings you some joy because you might think it didn't impact you. And then later today, you could be feeling really sad or this evening. But uh, I just want to say we don't do this to make anyone feel guilty or feel shameful. We do this really to inspire positive action and to give people hope that we can turn things around. Indigenous people are growing at a rate of four times that of any other population. So now the children are our future. They are the future, you know, teachers, lawyers, doctors, government workers, police. And if we influence them and inform them about these important matters, it's going to have an outcome on how they treat indigenous people and the huge population of indige growing indigenous uh, population for the years to come. Absolutely. We have, we do have a couple questions in the chat now. So uh, Christine Russell asks, can you please remind us of what indigenous sovereignty means? Well, that would mean that indigenous sovereignty would have a different meaning for everyone. But I think for, in my, when I see that reference, I would think of honoring indigenous governance, whether it be at, um, in, you know, there, <laughs> It's a longer explanation because you have governance that is banned uh, governments, and then you have traditional governance. Um, you have membership that is not, um, I, I'm a member of the List of Goods Band, but I live in Ottawa. I'm still a member. I still get to vote. So sovereignty, I think, is just all encompassing, but it, it, it's appreciating the roles and the nation to nation relationship. Be, of each First Nation and um, Canadians and the federal government, if, if I could give that kind of a little summary. It's a huge question. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and we had an anonymous user ask, can you speak about how children were taken from their homes, the 60s scoop, et cetera? Sure, I can make mention of that for sure. Um, so as you know, it was mandated or as you, you're learning that it was made um, mandatory that children were removed from homes for uh, originally they started with day school and then they said no we have to revert back uh, we have to go to residential school and most people don't know that and it's very difficult to find research on that but um, it initially started as day school and then they found that they would have too much contact with family food spirituality uh, language culture traditions so they're uh, they converted to the residential school system. And as you know, when the last school closed, as I mentioned in 97, a lot of the same administrators, yes, there were some uh, First Nation run, but the majority were not. And there we have it documented and the federal government has not disputed this. They have a settlement agreement 
with um, what is now known as day school survivors that experienced horrible traumas at day school as well, where the children were so terrified. And even when they did disclose to parents, there was little or nothing done about the atrocities continuing to happen at day school. And when that process stopped, another process was created, which is now known, and that was the handing over to provincial governments the responsibility of child welfare. And in many instances, children were removed, but for the fact, just because of their language, culture, um, teachings being separate from the dominant culture, poverty, um, and when we say poverty, financial poverty, but they may have been living comfortably off the land, um, hunting, eating wild meats, and that's not necessarily because it's a, uh, a separate diet from dominant culture that it's a bad diet or that it's poverty, but it was deemed that way. Um, so it's been described as initially starting in the 60s where they removed children from their families for many, many reasons, but primarily poverty and cult, you know, cultural differences. And you know, I'd like to say that that's over, but now we know that there are statistics that there's, uh, according to the First Nation Caring Society, there's 12 times more children in child welfare today than there were children in residential schools. So this is not an issue that has um, stopped. So it's, when people say, you know, get over it, it should heal already, the harms, it's okay to start healing if the harms didn't continue to happen. But unfortunately, they are still happening. Um, so that's just some, a bit of highlights about the child welfare situation. And it continues to be problematic. But we, along with you know, hoping our allies will be uh, addressing and eliminating the continuous removal of our children from our communities and families and nations. And uh, I know we're getting short on time. We have a very active chat. It's, it's pretty incredible to see all the questions rolling in. We have one from Simcoe Shore Secondary School, Aurelia Campus. And they ask, is the doctrine of discovery still being used in court cases? Um, well, as a lawyer, I remember being traumatized in my first year of law school, learning about all these con concepts and then seeing them repeatedly um, used within court cases. Now to say, is it specifically, yeah, I would probably say in some instances, it is not necessarily quoted in that way, but the subsequent legislation or the subsequent court cases that came as a result are, might be referred to, right? So you're still having um, constantly, even when Indigenous people have a Supreme Court of Canada right, and we believe we have our right from the creator and within our treaties, you're still having people um, have their rights limited, you know, recently with fishing and um, in, in the East Coast, you know, it's still continuing to happen. Indigenous people are always in the position of having to reassert their rights that we've gone to the highest court in the land using a system that's not ours, one, and even then it's not being implemented on the ground. I hope that answers that. Yeah, we, I think so as best we can, big questions. Yeah. Uh, we have another from uh, Jason Leroux says, how many indigenous languages have been lost and how many are left? So we know there's over 55 left. How many have been lost? That is a good question. I would have, I'm not sure. I don't want to guess and, and um, but I'd have to look into that actually. It's a good question, thank you. I'll and definitely. it sounds like we have time for one more question. And uh, Melanie McVitie asked, what is your advice for empowering Indigenous youth who lack confidence and or are struggling with their identity? And how do non-Indigenous people approach these issues who may be afraid to offend or unsure of what to do or what to say? Okay, so two, uh, I'll take that apart. So the first one, one of the things that we have found to be really helpful in um, instilling self-esteem, self-care, cultural pride has been the return to cultural teachings, the return to language, the return to ceremony. And we've even discovered that, uh, for example, if you're Mi'kmaq living in Alberta, but you're studying with a Cree elder, or you're, you know, uh, Maliseet living in um, Vancouver, 
that even doing traditional ceremony that is not connected to your peoples can still be beneficial and um, help significantly in healing and, and feeling self-worth and cultural pride and, you know, connection, right? It's all about feeling connected and a part of. And so ideally you want to learn about your own nation and your traditional teachings, of course, but when it's not possible, even doing any kind of cultural teachings. And at LHF, actually, we have a lot of tools that we're sharing online because of the current circumstances, but how to snare a rabbit, um, how to make tea, uh, how to make a drum. We're, we're doing all kinds of workshops like that. And uh, we have a youth project that we're coming out with the uh, publication about food sovereignty. So taking ownership over gr uh, growing our own traditional seeds, are using our own traditional seeds, growing our own foods, harvesting, harvesting at the time of the moon, sharing food and uh, sustainability. So, you know, there's another example of uh, sovereignty and what youth can do to feel better. Now for allies, as I mentioned, there's the entire, you know, there's a lot of resources available. But one thing I always tell people is if you think, if you come to things with an open and kind heart, not thinking that you know better or that you're coming to rescue any First Nation or that you will stand in front of, but stand beside and defer to what Indigenous people are saying and let them have the voice and just be the supporting ally. And sometimes it means just even bearing witness, right? There are instances where Indigenous people are discriminated against and an ally might not feel safe to be able to do anything in the moment. They can even just record it by recording it and bearing witness and attesting to that and then sharing it publicly after, that can go a long way. And you can always ask and say, I don't know what the appropriate term is or I'm not familiar with your protocol, but I would like to do the right thing. So to have you in our school or to invite you here or to go to this event, is there something that I should do? Is there something I should wear? Is there something I should bring? Those, you know, and I, and I think for the most part, elders and knowledge keepers, know that if you're coming with a good heart and in a good way that there is no you know grave mistakes and there are you know no wrong actions as long as you're coming not being this all-knowing and coming you know with a willingness to learn and be helpful that it will always result in in a, a good way thank you so much Teresa. it's it's been very, very phenomenal to be able to kind of bear witness to your expertise today. And I wanted to thank you so much for giving up a little bit of your time today to share that with us. Well, and, and thank you. Uh, yeah, my pleasure. Uh, I have a quick couple of reminders just before we wrap up today. Quick reminder to educators who are watching. Uh, Reconciliation and Me, a special broadcast by APTN, will be airing on APTN at 11 a.m. Central Time. Uh, please tune in to our national broadcast titled National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, uh, which will be live streamed on APTN, CBC, CBC GEM, uh, EC Telly, sorry, all the French speakers, uh, EC2.TV at 8 p.m. local time, 9 p.m. Uh, Atlantic, 9.30 NT, followed by a special program produced by CBC Manitoba. And wear an orange shirt, display orange in your home, and use hashtag light turtle island orange this week to show your solidarity. Uh, thank you again, everybody who uh, listened with us today. And of course, thank you, Teresa. Thank you. I honor you. Thank you. I'm watching us finish out of the corner of my eye on Hubelo. It's quite disorienting.
Good afternoon, Andre. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Yeah. 